Psychological Society of America workshop on writing a good title. My name is Bruce Kirchhoff. I'm a faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and I've been teaching scientific communication for a number of years, and in fact, have a book about presenting science, called Presenting Science Concisely. So we're going to use Einstein's quote here as kind of a guiding principle in what we talk about today. We want to find simple explanations for the work that we're going to be talking about, and I hope that when you look at your own work, you'll be thinking about simple explanations for it. That is being able to tell your audience in a simple one sentence, or maybe not even a sentence way, what the core message of your talk is going to be about. I really think that Einstein was right about this. The more that I've worked on it, the more I wish that someone had said this to me when I was a young scientist and that I'd been working for those early years on trying to refine my messages so that when someone read a paper or heard a talk from me, they knew what the takeaway message was. They knew what the most important thing I wanted them to learn is. And we're gonna put that most important thing today in the title. Now, there are other ways to write titles besides what I'm gonna advocate here. I hope that you agree with me by the end of the workshop that what I'm gonna suggest is the best way to write them, but you're certainly free to ignore this and write titles any way that you want to. But <clears throat> since you're here, I'm assuming that you're open to listening to my ideas and the ideas of some other people who have thought about this. So we're gonna look for very simple titles and we're gonna to try to tell the reader the main result in the title. So the work we're gonna be doing today then is always trying to distill the main result out of an abstract and write a good title that conveys that. Now there isn't necessarily a single one way to do this. And there's a number of reasons for that. But I think instead of trying to my explain it too much, I think you'll see as we go along and you'll see alternative ways to write good titles. For all the examples we're gonna to do today, I have written a title and we can also look at the title that the authors of the article wrote. I'm not gonna show you that title at the beginning though. <clears throat> I will show you eventually their title. Sometimes the authors have written really great titles, sometimes not so much. Sometimes my titles are good, Oftentimes you guys are gonna write a better title than I did today. I found that from other workshops that the participants often are writing better titles than I am. So I wanna say that there's no one way to do this. We're gonna, it's about thinking about the research. What we're doing is thinking about the research and trying to convey the main point of that research succinctly in a title. So let's start with the interactive part of the workshop. We've got a number of titles here. I am gonna send you out to another survey. And this time I'm gonna ask you to write these titles and I'm gonna ask you to pick one. It's gonna be which one do you think this is the best title of this group? You can only choose one, so you're gonna to have to choose one. The titles are gonna be in the survey so you can read them there. And then we're gonna give you a minute or so to do that. And then we'll come back here and talk about what people thought. Okay. I can. I'm now looking at my version of this and we have 13, 14 responses now. Let's see what people thought. And let's see if I can make that a little bigger. Okay, so people in general have liked four traits differentiate pollination syndromes and species but fail. And I'm sorry, we can't see that whole title there. And people like less niches, niches in space, time and environment, concepts and comparative contexts. Would someone like to say why they chose one of these and why they liked it? Actually, wrangling heterogeneous DNA plant traits was worse than niches. Yes, Sonia. Um, I really liked the floral traits one because it tells you the main findings of the paper, or hopefully it does. I haven't read the paper, um, but uh, it also has the location and some other really specific details. So I think really clearly demonstrates what the paper is gonna be about. Great, and kudos to Sonia for being the first one to speak up. Thank you so much. Let's have someone tell us why they didn't like niches. I'm sorry, now um, why they didn't like wrangling heterogeneous plant traits. I just didn't uh, select that because it's not the most descriptive and reading and reading the title is just kind of hard to understand what it would, the paper would be about. Uh, 
Yeah, kind of uh, what, because I also chose the floral traits one, so it's kind of the opposite reasoning uh, that the other individual just said that that one was so well, this one kind of was the opposite. You don't really know exactly what the paper will be about. It's kind of confusing, not much detail. Um, how many people know what wrangling means? I don't know how to get a survey of this, but. That, that was the word I had a problem with the wrangling. <laughs> oh, and, and we have a native American speaker who doesn't know wrangling. That's great. <laughs> Just think about how foreign students would do that. I've shown foreign students this and they have no clue what wrangling means. That's funny. Wrangling is a cowboy term. If you're a cowboy riding out on the plains and you got a heifer who's straight away and is stuck in a snowdrift, you got to go out there and you got to wrangle her back into the crowd. You got to get her back into the corral where she can be safe for the winter. It's a, so they're wrangling heterogeneous plant traits means they're struggling to make sense of them. Why they couldn't say that? I don't know, because they're cowboys, I reckon. Anyone else want to say something about any of the other, any of the other titles? I did like the revealing the dynamics of sunflower domestication with archaeological DNA, um, because I thought, I just thought if if that's what the paper was or the study was about, um, you're distinguishing the changes of how sunflowers domesticated in certain locations and compare it in, in using archaeological DNA to do that. So if, if it if the paper were about that, I thought that would be a good title and it's simple. Yeah, good. I mean, and that's a, that, you know, as titles go, that's a very good title. Yeah. And you can see the second, it was the second most commonly chose title here. So, and well, we'll talk about those kind of differences between um, the floral trait one and the revealing dynamics one as we go on. Let's go on and look at back at our next slide. How would you improve this title? Okay. Uh, well, to improve it, I, I'm one that doesn't just like love um, code questions as a title. So it seems like if you're presenting a uh, topic that you don't really know uh, like the answer to, and hopefully your research presentation are the results for this. So rather than saying, does earlier flower impact community seed, maybe say uh, community seed set impacted by early flowering in thus, thus way. Yeah. And thus, thus way. I mean, that would be great, wouldn't it? You'd actually know what you're going to hear in the talk. And if you were interested in that, or even if you weren't interested in this topic and you say, ah, there's this previously unknown um, interaction, unknown to me, I wanna go find out about it. Right now you could go to this talk and it could be somebody saying, well, I'm just starting my research. I don't have any results to present. I'm just gonna answer this question in my research. That's the talk. I mean, there is certainly a place for talks like that as students get, uh, get started on this. If this is the kind of um, title that all those talks had, you'd know what you were getting. But oftentimes people actually do have an answer who write a title like this. And wouldn't it be nice if you knew what that result was gonna be so that you can go and you'd be interested in it when you walked in the door. So the question, I would answer this question similar to Jack, to Jack and I would say, does it? Tell me, how would you improve this one? I'm just seeing some of the comments in the chat and I don't know which ones replied to which title, but <clears throat> so I will answer one of the first comments in the chat, which was, you don't know what paper these are. Of course, you don't know that. So all you're looking at is just the title here. And so if you were looking through a book of abstracts, right at a conference, the first thing you're gonna see is the titles. So this is like doing, looking through that abstract book and you're just seeing this title and you wanna say, how would I, how would you improve this title? You don't have to know what the paper is about to, be able to answer this. Okay, we've got a topic on this. Um, so here's two comments from the chat. I'd put Arctic biota first, possibly species names, so that you know the broad topic as the very first thing. Second, Arctic um, ancient is also a vague term, better Pleistocene, etc. So what dynamics are we talking about here? Um, I, I would have, here's another comment from the chat. I'd add something to make it appear to a broader ecological audience outside the specific field. So that's something we need to talk we need to talk about and we might as well start with it right now. And that is when you're writing a title, you've got to consider your audience. Really one of the most important things you can consider, you can do in scientific communication is consider who your audience is. So 
if this title, if this talk is being presented to a group of scientists who work on quaternary dynamics, you might write the title a certain way because you can assume certain things that they know about that field. If you're presenting this at a broad scientific meeting like the ESA meeting, you don't know who's gonna show up for the talk. It could be anyone, maybe it's a contributed talk. It's not in a symposium or anything. You might wanna write your title in a different way. You might want to make it appeal to a wider audience. You might wanna use less jargon, less abbreviations, make less assumption about it. If you're gonna give a talk to something um, at a library to the general public, you again wanna make it even more general. You don't wanna talk about quaternary dynamics, quaternary dynamics, you wanna put that in standard English. What does quaternary dynamics mean? So an audience is very important when you're considering these talks. And I've just been assuming up until now that you know what audience you're talking to. And my assumption has been you're talking to a broad ecological society audience where you don't know who's gonna be in the audience and you've got to appeal to that broad, broad audience. So we've got another meeting chat, um, genomics to understand the dynamics of Arctic biota. Any other suggestions what we might do to make this more specific? I've hinted at it already, what I think is missing here. What are quaternary dynamics? Only someone who works on quaternary dynamics might know what quaternary dynamics are. So what are we, what's the talk actually gonna be about? So specificity here is what I would like to do. I think this one's a little easier. This is the last one we'll do before we go on and do the next exercise. What's missing from this title or how would you improve it? Does this explain the main finding? Okay, here we have um, uh, in the chat, mentioned the specific adaptations and define extreme. Yes, exactly. What adaptations are we talking about, right? So what are the adaptations that this talk is gonna be about? And the second question is, is it important to know what the methods were? What, what is it that you want your audience to remember? Do you want them to remember your methods or your main result? Deb Meyer says main result, but could be the technique if novel. Yes, very good point. So right, if there's something special about the technique or a novel technique, you might want that in the title. And then Raven says, I would rearrange and remove extreme since it's not defined. And then she's actually rewritten the title. Um, deep sea sponges reveal skeletal adaptations under different flow simulations. Yeah, I think that's better. Even better if you knew what the adaptations were, but you, of course you don't know because you haven't read the paper. And then Jacqueline says, fluctuating flow simulations, I agree with Raven. Great, so you got the idea, what we're looking for here. And we're gonna do another survey. Let me get you the link. Again, the same as the first one. What's the best title? Okay, so we got even more consensus here about the inbreeding title about alpine ibex populations. And the one that people like least and a reconciled estimate of the influence of Arctic sea ice loss on Eastern Eurasian. And I don't remember the rest of that title. Would someone like to say why they chose what they chose? Well, I'm, I'm happy to say something. Uh, so I chose the inbreeding reduced long-term growth of alpine ibex population because it's a uh, very result-oriented. The only issue I had with this title was long-term growth. Like, so that's, uh, so, so normally in ecology, we talk about the abundance, like it's a little bit uh, unclear what the growth refer to. So let's set, so we started with Thomas on that title. Let's talk about the words Alpine Ibex. Under what conditions do you want the taxon name in your title? And under what conditions do you not want it in your title? And we had a, in the chat, we have an answer to Thomas's question. Uh, Jess suggests it should have been long-term population growth if that's what they were talking about. And it was. Uh, so and, you mean, so like Alpine Ibex as opposed to the scientific name? No, I mean um, the scientific name or the common name. And what, yeah. under what conditions do you put the taxon name in and under what conditions do you not? So the um, scientific name would only be good if people knew we're working on that group of 
um, animals, whereas if it's a more general audience, then I would use the common name. And in what conditions would you not put the name in at all? Um, so here's uh, Jacqueline says, if the abstract is only specific to one species, but what do you do then, Jacqueline? Do you put it in or you take it out if it's only specific to one species? And Jacqueline says, put it in if it's specific to one species. Let's, uh, there's another comment here, but I want to unpack Jacqueline's comment a little. What does that mean if it's only specific to one species? Um, for example, um, I, I have a little bit of published research. So mine was specific to the biological increase or changes, um, whether it increased basically the symbiotic relationship between Tephrosia curtisii and um, inoculation with actinomycetes. When I titled that one, I used both because it was both species names because it was specific to that study. Right. So that's on a that nice study. example of where you might want to use the species names, either the common names or maybe in this case, really the scientific names. Scientific names. But yes. are there cases where you wouldn't? Where you worked on alpine ibex, for instance, but you don't put the species name or even the common name in the title. Under what conditions would you do that? In one of my presentations that I gave to um, the legislatures at the Capitol here in Topeka, Kansas, I didn't utilize, because I study Antipogron drodii, big blue stem, um, and I didn't use either of them. I just said dominant prairie grass or prairie grass or something along the lines of that, because that's what it is. Um, and that's because it was such a general audience that I wasn't even talking to scientists at that point. I was presenting to legislators at the Capitol building. And if I call it Andrew Pargon, they're going to roll their eyes and be like, what in the world is that? But if you say prairie grass, that is a little bit more meaningful to a more general audience. I would only yeah. use uh, the scientific name. And uh, really, if I went to talk at a uh, botany conference, I was you. I would use Andropogarn, but even at ESA, I think last year I still called it a uh, dominant prairie grass just because ESA is broad. Some people are from the Midwest and know what a big blue stem is, but some people don't. So, yeah. So that's a nice example of knowing your audience and picking um, words in your title that are going to speak to that audience. I got two comments in the um, chat. I wanted to look back at Elizabeth's one. Um, so this was a response to the, my question of when do you put the species name in, in whatever form? And she says, only if it's a, to a group of bird specialists or is it extremely important species? Okay, and then we had Elizabeth saying, I'd exclude it if the audiences wasn't likely to be interested in the species specifically. And Clay says, I'd exclude names if you research it using an organism as a model system Otherwise, it's important to include scientific names for retrieval purposes. Of course, for retrieval purposes, you can always put them in keywords. So we can just take that second comment out of there. You can always get them in keywords if you don't have them in the title. But I want, let's go look at Clay's comment a little more closely. I'd exclude the names if your research is using an organism as a model system. What's he getting at? And Clay, you could come on and elaborate if you wanted to. Well, just my point was that um, often research is focused on uh, demonstrating or supporting um, a larger view um, uh, theory or hypothesis, and the organism is just a tool to get there. And in those cases, you're more interested in what, what the results of the uh, research are, not so much the specific organism that's being used to demonstrate results. Right, and so that's a, really a key question you need to be thinking about. Is your research generalizable beyond the organisms that you worked on? And of course, model systems research is always supposed to be. Not, it isn't always, but it's supposed to be. That's why we have model systems. But other research on non-model systems can be uh, generalizable beyond this. You could choose a specific organism to work on or a set of organisms because it's the best one to get at this much larger question. And you have to ask yourself in those cases, is it detracting from my, um, from my audience understanding that my focus is on these larger questions if I put the taxon name in my title? And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. It's, but it's a question you have to ask, I really need to ask yourself carefully. Many uh, research titles have the organism name in them and you read the paper and say, well, God, this is really an important work. This has got implications way beyond this organism. 
why in the world did they focus it on that organism? It's, you know, it's really important. It's much more important than that. They're misleading me by putting the title in there. So that's what I was trying to get at, to get at here. And the fact that it didn't just come jump out of everyone's mind and lips at the right time means that you should be thinking about it when you're, when you're publishing your research. Is it generalizable? Is your work really about a, a broad question? Okay, we spent a long time on the Alpine Ibex there. Would anyone else like to say something about one of the other titles? Yeah, Deb, good. Uh, it seems that the combined stressors of drought and invasion uh, reduce Douglas fir performance is about equally as specific as the inbreeding reduces long-term growth of the Alpine Ibex. So to me, they both seem kind of equivalent in terms of giving the main message of what the research was probably about. Yeah, and people chose that second, and I also think that that's a good title. It also is very specific and um, definitely tells you the effect, and it tells you the direction of the effect. I mean, oftentimes you'll find the um, titles that will say what the effect is or tell you a little bit about the effect, but they won't tell you the direction. And so they'll, and you say, well, did that have a good influence or that was a bad influence? I mean, what, so a lot of, you see this a lot in climates, uh, climate research, right? So that there's just this underlying assumption that climate change is gonna produce bad effects. And so people don't bother to say that in the title. They just assume it's uh, tacit knowledge in there. I'm not a big fan of tacit knowledge in, in these kind of situations. I think you should make it explicit and say if, if climate change has a detrimental effect, yeah, say climate change has a detrimental effect on these populations because of whatever you worked on. Bruce, I'd like to just um, uh, stand in favor of the biogeography of Penstemon. So uh, that actually was my uh, second choice. Um, but I would say the biogeography is a very large, complex topic, uh, as is Penstemon. And so what attracted me to this was the um, parsimony, the succinctness uh, of this very large topic. And that basically said it all for me. I liked it. Thank you so much for bringing that up, because I would have forgotten to say something about that. And I wanted to talk about that title. So under what conditions would you write a title like that? Under some conditions, that's a great title. One of the best, well, it's specific conditions. What are those conditions? I think it's specific. Um, someone just said a, a book. There you go, a book on biogeography of Penson. That's great. What about if it was a talk? Sonia, what do you think? Do you have your video on there and are looking interested and smiling? If you saw I... that title someplace, what would make you want to go hear a talk that was titled like that? Besides the title, I don't know because I really didn't like it. I don't like using the word reconciled. Well, maybe if it was by someone who had originally published the paper and then had come back, and so they said reconciled about their own word, but I don't know. Otherwise, I don't really like it. That wouldn't be my answer. You know, oh. if, if someone in the field, you know, I've been working on this for the last 30 years and they're gonna summarize their 30 years of research. By God, I'd want to hear that talk. And you would, it's not now, it's not just the title that's conveying it, it's the name of the person who's doing it and someone you know in the field. So this is very similar to Lona's um, answer. It's like a book, right? It's someone who has extensive knowledge in that field and is either editing the book or writing the book to summarize a big field of knowledge. Then it's, these kind of titles are great for those type of things. Now, I don't. I would say most graduate students probably are not gonna give a talk like that. But if you have a chance to do that and you're summarizing enough work, you think you can use a title like that. Again, in a symposium, another kind of place where you might find that is a symposium that was covering all different aspects of Penn STEM and biology. And you were dealing with this one aspect of it. And the other titles had, the other talks had similar kinds of titles that covered different aspects of the biology. Again, another place we'd use it. So it's all about context. There isn't a such a thing as just an absolute good title. These are things you need to take into account. These kinds of things we've been talking about are the kinds of things you need to take into account. Okay, we're gonna move on. Your turn, as if it hasn't been your turn already, but now it's really gonna be your turn because I'm gonna send you out to some breakout rooms and some um, Google documents where you can do some work on your own. But when I say it's your turn, I wanna do one little thing before I give it over to you. And that is talk very briefly about abstract structure. We'll do, we'll spend a workshop on this later on, but here's what 
<clears throat> the basic structure of an abstract. The things you should look for in these abstracts, we're gonna show you, they are not always gonna be in this order, but great abstracts do put them in this order. Really clearly written abstracts have them in this order. The current state of knowledge, a statement of the problem. What is it that the authors are working on? This is one thing that's often very commonly missing in, in abstracts. Most of the abstracts we'll see today have a problem clearly stated. Not all of them though, there's at least one that doesn't have a clear problem stated. And you can ask, if someone picks that one, we can talk about what these authors are doing. Then methods and results, that's usually the, the major part of the abstract. And you can get bogged down in there a little bit, which is why it's good to think about these four parts. And then the conclusion, which is often on really great abstracts is often the last sentence of the abstract, which kind of looks at the broader implications of what the research was done. Sometimes it has the a summary of the results and sometimes it's broader implications. But these are four things you can be looking about, looking for in these abstracts as you read the abstract and try to write a good title for them. Oh, and just here's an example of an abstract. I'm not gonna ask you to read it. I just wanted to show you a very nice clear abstract with the four parts in four sequential places. I don't want you to read that. And then the summary, if we actually looked at the title here, it summarized what they say in the last part, the last part of the abstract. So that's kind of what you're going for, a nice clear summary of the main finding. You know exactly what this paper is gonna be about. Okay, really your turn. So there are 21 papers here. And just you're to pick one, you have edit, you have the ability to edit these. So here's one of them. There's a place to write the most important takeaway and a place to write a title. You can select, select more than one title if you want to. You can work together on these if you find someone you'd like to work to, with. So what I'm gonna ask you to do <clears throat> is tell me which title you worked on or which abstract you worked on. I'm gonna bring that abstract up on the screen and you're gonna walk us through basically what the abstract is, what the most important takeaway is, and how you summarized the title in that. Is a volunteer or two volunteers to say what one, what did you work on? Crop diversity, what number is that? Oh, here we have, Thomas said one, one. Migratory birds, so Thomas first. Okay, Thomas, you wanna sure. walk us through it? Well, uh, sure, I'm gonna give it a try. Uh, so this study looked at the migratory birds uh, in the, so migratory birds going to their breeding grounds in the Arctic in the summer. Uh, and the study asked the questions that, um, what are the genetic determinants of migratory distance? Um, and, and then it explains that they looked at peregrine falcons uh, from six populations of which they uh, looked at the genomes of four of these populations. Uh, and then there's some background information how that may be related to, to evolution, um, going back to the last glacial maximum. And then they found a gene, a specific gene that was associated with population differences in migratory uh, distance. And this gene is associated with the long-term memory. Um, yes. Um, uh, and so that's a significant finding um, because it shows that there's some it's evolutionary determined uh, how these different populations uh, migrate. Uh, and then there's some, it finishes off with some um, perspectives, uh, implications that uh, this is important to know this because there's like uh, there's a rapid climate change. And well, so, so I said a little bit more than the most important takeaway, but you can all see the text here. And I, I struggle a little bit with the title. And of course I'm interested in the feedback, but I said long-term memory is the main trait explaining migration routes of peregrine falcon populations in the Eurasian Arctic. Right, so Thomas has identified long-term memory 
as a very important takeaway from this meet, <clears throat> from this paper. Now, that is not the only possible takeaway you could take from this paper. That's not an, thing that you could, you know. So when I say that there's no way, there's no one way to do this, I mean that other people can read this paper and they can say, well, I think that the most important takeaway was this. Our, <clears throat> our task today is not to get the titles right. Our task is to give you some experience of thinking about how you would pick out the most important aspect of a piece of research so that when you look at your research, you can be thinking about this. So you can be thinking about what your research, most important thing is in your research. And by most important thing, I mean, what do you want your audience to remember? Because if you can put that in the title and then highlight it in your talk, they're gonna go away remembering that thing. Whereas if you have four or five different things they're supposed to remember and you know, they might remember you for giving a very poor talk, which is not what they, you want them to remember. Before. You wanna remember that key piece of evidence so that when they have a job opening or they've got a postdoc or something, you know, they're gonna think of you because of this great, uh, great talk that you gave. So this is really not about these, are, these abstracts that we're looking at, it's really about your work. And we're using the abstracts as a proxy for how you're gonna think about your work. So let's look at a couple other possible titles here. Here's my title and here's the author's title of this. So like Thomas, I wrote a pretty long title, Reading Populations of Peregrine Falcons. And I put the taxon name in the title here. And that is, that I, I, that's a bias on my part. So I come out of taxonomy and morphology, plant taxonomy and morphology. And we pretty much always put the taxon name there. I am not sure that it always belongs there, but I wanted to identify a definite bias on my part. And so you'll see a lot of my titles have the taxon name in there. And you should be thinking whether that's really necessary. So breeding population of peregrine falcons use five migration routes across Eurasia maintained by environmental divergence and long-term memory. And the authors, climate-driven flyway changes and memory-based long-distance migration. So comments on any of these titles that people would like to make? Well, uh, I have one comment. Uh, so, so when I read the author's title, I'm very confused what all this means. Whereas when I read uh, Bruce's um, title, um, it, it's very clear what the study is about. Uh, because it has some very specific information. I don't know whether five migration routes are important, but at least it's specific and gives some context. Uh, and uh, there's also the environmental divergence, which I think is important. I didn't mention it, but it's also important. There's a trade-off you see between what the authors did, which is a very short title, but maybe not as explanatory, and the titles that you and I did, Thomas, which are much longer, but are much more explanatory. And you've got to take that into account too. How, you know, what if it's going to a journal, will the journal accept a title that's that long? And then you have to think about it, as Thomas was looking at mine and say, do you really need five migration, migration routes in there? You know, is that really necessary to explain what this um, paper is about. So the first time you write a title doesn't mean that's your title. I mean, people tend to write these titles and they just kind of throw them out there and that's they're done because they got a title that's done. But I want you to think about it a little more. Think about whether it's really communicating what you want and maybe rewrite it several times. I could go back and rewrite this. Thomas could go back and rewrite his. And maybe we'd find something between the author's title and our title that was more explanatory. The, let's look at another one. Someone said they worked on crop diversity. And that is number nine. And this is Paula. Paula. <laughs> yep. Paula. Hi. Uh, well, basically, when I was, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, nice. So, nothing. I just read the, this uh, abstract, and it looks like um, it's like explaining how diversity in crops can help to uh, ameliorate the effects of uh, changes in temperature, uh, rainfall, and then basically, for, for what I take, I don't know if this was so easy because I think it's clear about that diversity in crops helps uh, to overcome the, the 
desestabilizing effects of abiotic factors is basically what is plain because of course if you have like multiple crops that are adapt to different uh, conditions climatic condition then it's going to help and then also with the title well i just suggest uh the the ones that is best like crop diversity increased temporal stability in food production because the, the that's what the main goal the main goal is food production you know in how these uh crop diversity in a, a help a, to uh, produce food under uh, changes in, in abiotic factors. But I don't know if I'm right. Like everything you That's said, what I understand that, from the abstract. <laughs> I like everything you said except that last sentence. So that's a great, short, succinct title. Let's see what I wrote and see what the authors wrote. Okay. So I've got increasing the diversity of crops, increases the stability, of the national harvest and offsets destabilizing effect of variability in precipitation. And the authors, national food production stabilized by crop diversity. So now we've got some ones to compare. Anyone else want to want to weigh in about these titles? And nice, thank you. Um, I like that Paola's is sort of um, kind of the uh, middle ground between uh, your title and the author's title. Um, uh, I don't know enough about uh, submitting a nature paper, but I hopefully it kind of says enough while still being pretty succinct. Um, and I like that it includes temporal stability. I think that that's an interesting uh, distinction. Yeah, I think Paula did a really nice job of her with her title. I like it better than mine. Mine's a little wordy. Evans, did you work on one? Yes, I am. Jacqueline had worked on number 17, but I think Jack had written, Jackie had written something. So Jackie, please. So I just came up with a symbiotic relationship between nitrogen fixing plants and the Mediterranean Sea, or it should be in the Mediterranean Sea. It was my title and the author's title, mine, <clears throat> nitrogen fixing symbiotic mm. seagrass. And again, I got the taxon name there provides ammonia and amino acids in exchange for sugars. So mine was really detailed. The authors, terrestrial type nitrogen fiction symbiosis between seagrass and a marine bacterium. I'd like some comments on these. We've got three really different titles here. Which ones do you like and why? Well, uh, <clears throat> I haven't read the, the, the entire abstract, um, but I probably like the author's title the most. Um, because I think it's interesting that the uh, seagrass use a terrestrial type nitrogen fixing bacteria um, because there's uh, some analogy between maybe convergent evolution. So I, I find that very interesting. I definitely like um, Jacqueline and um, the other collaborators title and the author's title. And I think they're very similar. And I would maybe, if it were me, I would pick one for doing a talk for a non-scientific audience or a very high level talk. And then maybe pick the author's audience uh, or the author's title for an audience that knows a little bit more about nitrogen fixation and symbiosis and stuff like that. I like both of them. I think they both are, really attention grabbing and very simple, but um, you know everything you need to know about what the talk's gonna be about. Yeah, I think I agree. They're both good good titles. And I think that's a really nice point, Sonia, about different audiences for those two titles. Got time for maybe one more. It helps, yeah, okay. So we did the Wait. land water resources number 10 and because we didn't really finish in the end, you still see our comments uh, at the bottom of the document. But um, the first thing is we liked the abstract because you had everything that uh, we were discussing was needed. So it states the current state of knowledge. Um, so it's about uh, vegetation taking, uh, oh, doing water uptake and the authors uh, looked at different sources of water uptake um, and they did this at different spatial and time scales. So they 
for us, the main takeaway was that 70% of plant transpiration relies on precipitation. In the current month, they also looked at um, plant transpiration in relation to groundwater, etc. But what we liked also was that the authors mentioned that obviously this is very context specific and more research is needed at different um, um, spatial temporal scales. So the title we suggested, which perhaps is a bit long, but was evaluating water uptake by, by vegetation shows plant transpiration relies on monthly precipitation and is influenced by its spatial temporal scales. Uh, we were discussing towards the end whether we were uh, lengthening this with by the space and time origin of water source. Personally, because of my background, uh, I prefer a shorter title. Uh, so perhaps it's a bit long. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't know if Leah wants to add anything. Um, yeah, I guess when I was reading the abstract, it just really stuck out how much of their data and results they gave. Um, so it's difficult um, for us to decide what to include in the, the title, um, but I think, that they also summarize at the very end with kind of a, a generalized like going forward that they have several different factors that are influencing these based off those different sources. And I think we tried to put those together because it wasn't something where you could just say this was this one result. It's like a lot of these different influencing factors. Let's kind of build off what she's just, what Leah's just said and ask uh, what's the problem they're addressing? Um, where vegetation is getting their water uptake from, like what water, like what source in the water okay, cycles. Okay, that's fair. Yep, that's fair. And does it say that any place? Yeah. It, it does. does? Oh, boy, I had a hard time finding it. Where did it say it? It said here. Um, that's very clear, actually. From, uh, yeah, from source one, which is uh, monthly precipitation. Yeah, those are results. I wouldn't, I'm sure I would call those. I oh, mean the statements. geographical, okay. This the is the one I didn't find, I didn't find a problem statement. I'm not saying the research is bad. I'm just pointing out, I don't think there's a problem statement here. And yeah, when you're writing these, you have to think about whether that's, is that important to have a problem statement? All the others we've looked at so far have had pretty clear problem statements. This one does not. It just goes in and starts saying we, did this. So you could say it's like exploratory research, right? But they don't say why this exploratory research is really important until kind of at the end, they kind of come around to it a little bit at the end. Would it be better if they put that at the beginning? That would have yeah, helped okay. me because I had to read it several times just to start to understand it. I had the same experience reading this one, right? I, I read this more than any other one because I wasn't sure what they were doing or why they were doing it. So it's something you should, you should think about. This is really pretty cool detailed research that I think has got a good result, but I think they could have explained it a little better in the abstract. And this is the kind of thing we'll talk about more when we get to the abstracts workshops, right? That a problem statement is really helpful for your audience to help understand why you're doing this research, what they should be paying attention to the research. Not that you're just describing something. Now I'm, all of my research has been describing and I've had this problem in all of my research so I am telling you all the mistakes that I've made over 35 years or more and saying, please don't make these same mistakes. So my title, inverse modeling and stable isotope estimates show that the origin of plant water resources vary by region and season and can inform ecosystem management and the author's spatial temporal origin of soil water taken up by vegetation. So you see their title also doesn't have clear problem statement in it either. And my title, is really way too long and goes into way too much detail about the methods that they used because I didn't understand what their problem was. This is a nice example of how having a clear statement of your problem will really help you write a good title because it'll know how, how to focus your title. In my case of my really long title, right, I started to focus on techniques because I couldn't tell what the, what the main point was here, what the single thing they wanted to me to take away here. Well, I wanna thank you all. I do have a website and <clears throat> also a blog and a YouTube channel. And you can find all of those on my website for signing 
Science Concisely, which is also in the name of my book. And you can get a 20% discount on it if you sign up for my newsletter. You'll get a code when you sign up and you can use that code on the publisher's website to get a discount. And I wanted to thank you all again for staying to the end. I hope it's been helpful. Yes, Sonia. Oh, that was just um, a, a clap emoji. Oh, thank you clap. very much. It was a thank great you. workshop. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for participating.